must unite what has been set aside. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome to Phoenix Rising Radio. Now is the time to lift your mind higher. Now is the time to rise above. I am your host, Phoenix, and welcome to tonight's broadcast. Yeah, good evening. Welcome, everyone. This is Phoenix. I hope you guys are doing well. It is Thursday, September 14, 2017. Half a month is gone. More than half a year is gone. Where did it go? And where are we going to go? And where are we right now? That's what we're going to talk about this evening with Nase. He's joining me live. Nase, how's it going, brother? I am rolling just as well as I had the other day. My... Right tire's a little flat, but I'm still rolling as per usual. Oh, okay. I wasn't really sure about what context you were saying there, rolling. But um, that can go a lot of different directions with you. Anyway, I'm glad to hear you're doing well. And uh, crazy stuff going on. You know, I talked to Dr. Phil. We had a, a repeat show on Tuesday with Dr. Phil on that he had done um, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago. And I just want to let everybody know that he is safe and sound. He evacuated, actually. He and his wife evacuated the area, Daytona Beach area, and took off and went to Arkansas. And he goes there to um, a place, uh, um, Springs or something like that. But anyway, he contacted me. His home's okay, just small branches. His neighbor checked on it and everything. And it's all good. They're safe and sound. And also Bob Gilpatrick of Boomers Forever Young. They are up and operating, as you know, or you may not know, Tampa area, the St. Petersburg area where their office is, St. Petersburg, was spared major damage and the inventory is okay and they are back and running and getting orders out. So um, if you have something going on there, uh, if you have orders pending, just be patient and they will get them out. Nay, say, what are you doing there, man? Sounds like you're cleaning out your toolbox. Oh, I'm like, sorry. We're just finishing up some things for the day. I didn't know it was that loud. Oh, uh, okay. I apologize. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's cool. I mean, I wash my dishes too and clean out my toolbox. That <laughs> <all right. laughs> yeah, was pretty loud. No biggie, dude. Uh, um, I mean, that stuff happens. You know, that spark. Um, things happen. That's just the way it is. But anyway, um, how's it going? Uh, I know that you went to. A Festival, and you were festivaling, and it wasn't the Burning Man. Oh, by the way, did you see the Burning Man celebration this year? A man actually killed himself. He ran into the Burning Man structure, and uh, they rescued him out, but he died like a day a day later. So there was actually a self human sacrifice that occurred at Bur- Burning Man this year. How weird is that? And there's been a lot of talk about it, like. Yeah, no surprise. I don't know. You know, well, I've never 
from mm-hmm. my research, the original Burning Man was back in ancient Europe, and they actually made these huge edifices of a man and a woman, and they were stuffed with slaves and then set on fire. Stuffed with slaves and then set on fire. Wow. You know, some things change, some things don't. That sounds like the type of thing that Hillary Clinton would love to do. I mean, could you imagine? (laughs) Like, let's build giant statues of deplorable people and we'll stuff them with deplorables and set them on fire. (laughs) Yeah, That's the sadness about the the history of, of... sacrifice you know even from in the biblical you know they with abraham and god with the sacrifice of the son and in the story of itself of god sacrificing his son and the the sacrifice and unfortunately when you look into the aspect of energies we as silly humans are an abundant of energy and and going along with some of the research of how they created philosopher's stones or the sorcerer's stones also needed a huge sacrifice of mortal souls. Yeah, the um, I believe it was the ancient Mayans and one of the Aztecs also. Um, Aztecs were ferocious about it. They did a lot of human sacrifice. Oh, my gosh. From... You know, uh, they speculate that some of the pyramids uh, that they have there in, in South America, the, where they did the sacrifices on top, were just like rivers of blood that flowed down the steps of these things. We well, you know the misnomer on that from being indigenous and researching all of that. All of the majority of the sacrificing happened after the Spaniards were there. Because they wanted to, you know, they wanted all of the gold. So they would help support the different, you know, huge prominent villages and said, go out and get us more gold. And so they would go and pillage and sacrificing the surrounding communities in that. There's, um, you know, in the history of a lot of indigenous people around the world, they have some dark history. The Anishinaabe people of my ancestry there is a, a part in their history where they talked about openly cannibalism. Oh, yeah. There was a, a branch of a tribe that were committing cannibalism. Oh, you know? there, there were quite a few of those, dude. They were the, some people uh, speculate they were the leftover of the Anunnaki. They're here in the Northeast. Well, you know, you'd be familiar with this also. There was a tribe called the Susquehannock. And the Susquehannock um, were really kind of uh, um, not accepted by the other tribes of like the the five nations, uh, the Iroquois, et cetera, um, the Lenape, et cetera, because they were odd. They were very tall. They had red hair. They had, quote, strange weapons, and they're ferocious and known for eating their victims. Yeah, they were cannibalistic, and there were writings of about them um, from some of the missionaries that came over, the Jesuit mi- missionaries early on as um, the Europeans were settling, and, and they talked about the Susquehannock, and there's also, you know, the, the um, giants, what they call the giants of Ohio, many of the mound builders of Ohio, a lot of those mounds were exhumed and found to have, you know, uh, human beings of great stature. You know, like eight, nine feet, really huge. And some of them had red hair. They called them the red hair giants of Ohio. And there, this was a race of, um, I, won't, I won't even call them indigenous people, that were basically separate and, and not really accepted and, and were fought by the indigenous peoples. Um, very odd. You know, a lot of stories. I know uh, here in the Northeast, there's a lot of uh, stoneworks. And they call them cairns. They have cairns in, in um, you know, Scotland and England. You'll see these stone works. And they're like monuments made of loose stone. But there's a phenomena around the northeast here, up into Maine, New England, down in Pennsylvania, of uh, all of these stone works are like walls, these strange stone walls and all this. And a lot of people assume. 
assume that these were made by farmers. When the original farmers came over here, the Europeans, they were clearing their land and they made these walls. They cleared the stones. Well, some of that in a limited amount is true. But there are writings, and I've read some writings from uh, the early 1700s of some of the, the priests that were here. And they were curious and they asked the Lenape people, uh, which means the first people, um, about these stone works because they noticed all these stone areas, almost like cities built, but the Lenape, the Delaware, had nothing to do with them. They never camped in them. They never went around them. And so the the Jesuits being you know historians and curious and scientific-minded, they were – they went to them and they were curious and they wanted to know why the people had nothing to do with these stone works. And they told them that because they didn't build them because the priests were saying, why did your people build these? They said, we did not. Now here's a curious thing. The Lenape, the first people allegedly by uh, lineage and even some the indigenous uh, tales were the first and the indigenous people spread from the east and northeast down across the other nations, and that's why they were called the first people, the Nanape. And they said the legends of their people were that was when they first came there, there were a strange people who were living in the land. They were very tall, they had red hair, and they were ferocious peoples, and they were the ones who had built these structures. And because of that, they stayed away from them because they thought it was like bad medicine. Yeah, I you know it's it's incredible how little we really know about North America, especially because of you know the the written language or the the petroglyphs or the symbology that they used, you know, was totally different than an alphabet, mm-hmm. and and just because of the the genocide of such a large amount of people, the history has been lost and absolutely distorted oh not you know? only not only the genocide of the people themselves but of their history dude i have read things i love reading the old histories you can find them you know the his, they'll have uh, histories of different counties and areas and we have a lot of them here in the east because it's where you know they first came through and this will be like the history of such and such county of uh, 1740 And this will be like a historical work and go back into the 1600s. Dude, you read some of these crazy things that they found. Um, Oh, my God. Stone houses and stone structures that the farmers would find and then they would blow them up or destroy them, you know, so they could clear their fields. They would find these huge mounds and they wanted to plant there. So they would dig them all up and scatter the remains and all the artifacts around. Uh, Just crazy stuff. I read one... um, Two encounters that I was just shocked by. Well, three, actually. One was a a chief, an Indian chief's grave that had been desecrated by a group of young boys. A group of adolescent boys knew about it. They found it. It was well marked or monuments. They tore it all down, dug up his bones and threw his bones all around. Was that the skull and bones when they went and took Geronimo's head? No, those were other bad boys. (laughs) These were young boys back in the early 1700s. And uh, another story that, that kind of blew my mind was uh, some boys, there was a, they found a stone trough, the people who came here, that a uh, spring ran into with ornate carvings on it. It was very large. And the local peoples, the uh, Iroquois, the, the uh, excuse me, the um, Lenape, said they didn't build it. And so this thing was old. And what happened to it? A bunch of boys smashed it with hammers and broke it apart for fun. And my, it's, like, it's like they didn't even get punished for this stuff. My senior paper when I uh, went to University of Minnesota was uh, titled Dam Engines. And it said the Hoover Dam holding back more than water. And from my research that they spe- the, the Army Corps of Engineers specifically pick that spot purposely to create Lake Mead, which now has, you know, everybody knows Lake Mead. It's the creation from the Hoover Dam. And the area that Lake Mead covers now and the depth of it 
allegedly buried an ancient village that was blowing away the the basic model of of the uh, the Bering Straits theory, and that they actually went in there and not only cemented in the dwellings or the kivas that they uh yeah it just uh and now there's 80 estimated 80 feet of muck or silt that's covering these ancient dwellings and then even if if you look into the grand canyon national park all of a sudden you'll see these crazy names that are based off of egyptians you know and so you know basically it's another example of how our history has been his story where they have literally rewritten the history books to change our paradigm maybe that's what the mandela effect really is the mandela effect is just the elitist just pointing out and proving how horrible our memories are and that we're constantly second guessing ourselves as it is that if they took the time to go back and change the Berenstein to the Berenstein or these little minutiae enough for people to start questioning it. Like, do you remember this? And it's like, I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. Oh man. So many people are like that. Yeah. I don't know. That's a, that's a topic in itself back. You know, we're talking about ancient history here. Let's talk about some recent history. As of a few hours ago, North Korea launched another missile and it was detected that there was activity at one of the missile sites just days ago. Now, apparently, I'm reading from the, uh, the news here. It says, North Korea has fired an unidentified missile t- eastward from its capital, Pyong, a U.S. official confirmed to Fox News. And is our favorite uh, cruiser still out there? Which one? Our carrier? Oh, uh, there's all kinds of stuff all over. Where exactly they're at, I don't know. They pulled some of those back. Um, why or what? You know, an interesting uh, thing also, there's a report out that the nuclear submarine, USS Jimmy Carter, actually returned to port and was flying a Jolly Roger pirate flag. And that is an oddity because... That was a tradition that came from World War I when the British were actually sinking German ships. And every time they would get a kill at sea, they would uh, fly a Jolly Roger when they returned to port. Now, the Jimmy Carter is a very secretive sub, and it has been known to come back in with a Jolly Roger before. And I'm really not sure what it signifies, but it does. there's a lot of speculation that they did something in a military fashion when they were out to sea. Now, obviously, they probably didn't sink a ship. We would have heard about it. But USS Jimmy Carter also has capability, and I think some people listening will find this interesting, to release on the seafloor remote submarines, remote vehicles that have the ability to cut undersea cables. How about that? We had a rash of undersea cables being cut in the Middle East, just uh, over the past five years, huge communication cables that would cut the Middle East off from from Europe and from the United States. And all these undersea cables were being cut. And there was speculation, oh, possibly a ship's anchor drug and broke them or whatever. But now it's coming out that the USS Jimmy Carter submarine has that specific capability and has been known to do that. So something's afoot, dude. They're, they are doing something bizarre. But... um. You know, it's really raising the tensions because apparently Kim, Kim Jong-un of North Korea fired this missile in the direction of Japan. You know, it's it's so bizarre. Well, is it really bizarre? But when when you reflect on just what has been happening within the last couple of weeks with the eclipse, you know, now three weeks behind us now. Or is it four now almost? But uh, three weeks. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. Four. Well, between three and four weeks. And it seems like the the oscillation has 
gone from one extreme to the other extreme where this outdoor festival that I went to this weekend, um, there was this consistency of the, of people discussing the tension. And there was a lot of talk about the proverbial fan getting hit and the amount of people that were also sharing with, with me, uh, just, major trials or challenges that were arising and and just oscillating from one end to the other where they're 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 not even realizing if they're coming or going and it seems like the powers that shouldn't be are continuing this whole distraction of where our heads are being whipped from left to right with everything that's occurring yeah well, you know, we talked about this, and I knew this was going to happen. It's been, excuse me, it's been brought up. This energetic that we ran into going into the eclipse, like I was telling everybody, it was like a portal. It was like a doorway. And you had to basically set your trajectory by setting your mindset in a certain way of positive outcomes, positive aspects, saying no to fear and not being caught up into this because when we hit that point, things were kind of accelerated and we were all shot off in a certain direction. And we basically, there's like a couple pathways out there right now, almost like a new beginning and a new path. And there's time right now still that people can say, you know what, I'm not going to give in to fear and all this nonsense and they can get on the right path. But that door's closing. There's a shutoff period coming here. And energetically rolling into the beginning of uh, October, like right around the first week, October 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, right around in there, uh, it's going to be pretty pretty intense there and things are going to really start taking off. But we've actually entered energetically, they say, a period of quickening, if you will. I believe it started like on the 6th of this month and um, about a week ago and it's intensifying every day and now we're, we're strongly into it and people are going to start to see things happening quickly in between now and the end of this month up to like the 28th and really start accelerating. But here's the, here's the thing, dude, it's going to accelerate in both directions in good ways and in bad ways. And just like, you know, if you start going a certain direction, it's, and you're, you're not really going fast. You can like slow down like, ooh, make a course correction. But if you get build up speed, the faster you're going, the harder it is to stop. And you get to a point you can't stop. And that's what's happening. This trajectory, this path that we all were birthed into by our own minds and design on the 21st with the eclipse is starting to pick up speed. And that's what you witness this weekend. Yeah, well, I, I would agree with that. And then if you think of the golden mean spiral and then you overlay the Fibonacci sequence on that, where it's the, the difference between man and woman or, or even I would say man and man and God and the curve, the smooth curve would be God and man as in us we would be that fibonacci sequence where we go straight for a certain period of time and then it's right turn and those right turns are what are so disruptive like you're saying you know because mother earth she doesn't draw a straight line you know mother earth draws a curved line and and man is the silly ones that we have to you know do the lines from this point to the other point from the beginning to the end and then the powers that shouldn't be, they love that right turn Clyde when everything's all disruptive and then it, it settles down and then we go on that, that, that uh, course again until there's that next right turn or left turn depending on what hemisphere you're on, I guess. Mm -hmm. Which direction you're going. You know, and like with the Fibonacci spiral, you know, things in nature spiral. And, and what direction are we going here? What direction are you going? And, and we are going into a quickening where we're going down to like a zero point. And as these curves, as the spiral gets closer and closer in, 
things naturally begin to speed up and intensify. It's almost like if you've, um, and I know everyone listening has seen a person doing figure skating and uh, a man or a woman, and they will begin to do a spiral and they're usually like on one skate and they'll start to spin their arms are out, one leg is out and they're spinning in a circle on one point on one skate. And all of a sudden they become you know, they, they go faster and faster and faster and faster until it's very intense. Now, how did they increase that speed? Because once they go up there and they, they flip around that energetic, they're spinning at a certain speed, but something happens that they do. They actually draw their arms in close to their bodies and their leg that's extended in towards their body. And that compression, that bringing in, that, that tightening of their mass actually increases their spinning speed until they start spinning really fast. Uh, and it's really amazing how that happens. And that's what we're uh, experiencing right now. We're going into one of those points. We're going down to like a zero point. And, man, dude, we're starting to spin a little faster here. And things are, things are starting to freak people out, I'd say. But, Phoenix, don't start talking about field theory because, you know, we, we got to go along with feeding the system and the powers that shouldn't be. This is, this is like deep conversation where people have to really reflect on, you know, something as simplistic as, oh, if, if we gather in together, if we gather together collectively, we work better, we oscillate better, we generate more energy that's 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 too deep phoenix (laughs) (laughs) too deep too deep for some but i tell you what not for the listeners of phoenix rising radio and truth frequency radio and we and the chat room that's it one more break will be no hate no hype no fear we are efr your protection from, from deception Something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop, children What's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Welcome back. Here we are on TFR with Phoenix Rising. It's me, Naysay, and we are here slash here. And I've been bestowed with the honor of bringing us back from the break. So I hope you've been with us. We've been talking about what's going down. And as per usual, things are always going down and things are always going up. But one person that's always up with it is Phoenix are you there, Mr. Upman? I am here. I am Mr. Upman. Yeah, I just sitting there reading some of the uh, headlines we have going on here. Yeah, a lot of people are uh, kind of freaked out about this North Korean missile, and apparently the South again is calling for emergency meetings and all this. They, um, they're really not sure. Now, what's this? The latest North Korean missile could have hit Guam. What the heck? Who put this out? Oh, okay. Well, that's the range. The the range that, that the missile uh, went was uh, 3,700 kilometers from its launch point, which is further away than Guam. Yeah, they, they've exhibited that ability before. So more saber rattling. But more than saber rattling, it's um, pretty provocative what they're doing. It's almost like they're trying to goad the United States into doing something. And the United States is up against a wall on this, people, because China and Russia, ah, they basically have the back of North Korea. A lot of they're people, obligated through treaty. Yeah, they have a treaty. Um, they have worked with them for a long time. Heck, Russia just opened up a deal with North Korea 
two or three weeks ago for tourism because the beaches, apparently they have some really beautiful beaches in North Korea, and um, they made a deal. The Russians are building some luxury resorts and stuff there. They're dealing with them, but the big one, people, is Korea is one of two places that we know of on Earth that have the largest deposits of rare earth minerals. And rare earth minerals are vital for the use in the high-tech industry. And they want those rare earth mineral minerals. The other place is Afghanistan. Um, so how this all plays out, I do not know. Will they be like some type of sacrificial lamb? There's been a lot of prophetic things about war with North Korea and that it didn't work out too well for everybody involved. I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to see how this progresses. But, you know, we're, before the break, they say, you were talking about these energetics and how uh, kind of heavy they were. So you were at this festival with uh, over 4,000 people. And what else did you experience there? What was, the, what was this energetic you were picking up? Um, well, the, the festival was called Shangri-La. It used to be called the Harvest Fest, and it's held at Harmony Park in southern Minnesota, um, Geneva, Minnesota. And uh, it was put on by a band called Wookie Foot. And I know two of the major entities in this band, Mark and Jojo, you know, for 17 years now. And I've been going to this outdoor festival. My first time was in 97 when I was just walking with a cane. To this outdoor event and over the years witnessing it going from uh you know just a small maybe a thousand people for the weekend to now four thousand people with i i would estimate probably about 1500 volunteers and you know and, and in itself i'm known as the megaphone man there and uh, this is how I got that AKA because I would roll around with the megaphone and I would banter with the crowd and I would try to, as I claim, um, share a little knowledge with my sledgehammer of love. And, uh, and so I would, you know, try to use humor in order to open up some of these kids' minds to some of these things that we discuss here on the show. And, uh, as I'm going through, people would come and share with me pretty much the same story of this constant challenge after challenge, you know, one after another, just continuously to rise and, and everybody having this almost pending doom, you know, like they felt like, well, I wouldn't say doom, but just this anxiousness that something was going to occur. And it's really funny because um, one thing that I kept saying to this crowd this weekend is that, you know, we're all giving a bunch of lip service and we're all a bunch of hippiocrites, you know, because we are. <laughs> if you live within the confines of America, we're all hippiocrites because the, the system isn't working. And yes, I agree that some of us are doing and playing our part in the change or helping people make better choices, you know, but what are we really doing? Like, should we literally be marching in Washington and saying clear house, you know? And, and one of the things that I was joking about this weekend was starting a new political party. And I think I've shared that here before of the cannabis resolution party. And I made the joke that, Minnesota is having a, a governor's race this year for elections. And I made the comment, let's have cannabis run for government and naysay for lieutenant governor. Because that way, when cannabis wins, they'll definitely kill cannabis. And then I would be governor by default. But um, <laughs> but then uh, these, these, these individuals... They're trying to talk of this enlightenment, the Shangri-La, of, of making this a better world. You know, finding the Shangri-La within yourself and then 
then changing the perspective from in yourself to your surroundings, to your community, to your, you know, your, your county and then to your state, you know, but the oddest thing that I witnessed this weekend is, um, this hyper feminism movement that women and, and don't get me wrong, I would be a feminist too if it wasn't for the name. Because I think the word feminist in itself is sexism because I would rather be an equalist than than a feminist. Because a feminist makes the pro- proclamation of female first. So I would rather be an equalist. But But this weekend I kept hearing women talking about how, oh, I'm a goddess. I'm a goddess. I'm releasing the goddess in myself. I'm finding the goddess and I should be treated as a goddess. And I kept thinking to myself, if men were marching around saying, I'm a god and I should be treated as such, I don't think a lot of people would tolerate that. Dude, that's hilarious. That is so funny. I could just like see all these guys walking down the street, we are gods, you know, and the, the God movement for men. That's true. I mean, any type of movement that signifies an individual, a group, or as separates someone and claims it to be a movement, they're actually creating more of a problem. They are causing more, more division. I mean, truly, it shouldn't be a feminist movement. The same way it shouldn't be a, a, a male chauvinist movement or it shouldn't be a black lives matter or a white lives matter. All lives matter and all are equal. And I agree with you on equalism. You know, the whole thing that I've had, ha- I've noticed over the years is how the very efforts they make and steps they take create more problems and cause more division. And I think it's by design, dude. I really do. Oh, absolutely. And and just by the fact alone that a new movement or a new cycle occurs, that's that's all that needs to happen in order to cause the disruption. Because like, you know, Ezekiel and wheels within wheels, you know, so we have these little fads that are their little cycles, you know, where it's like onesies or man buns or beards, or, you know, the, you know, the latest fashion, the latest movement. And so when there's all of these movements or cycles that one has. Stop right there. Did you say onesies? I think I saw this where they're trying to bring in for people to wear, especially men. And I guess women too, these onesies. If you don't know what a onesie is, maybe some of our listeners in Europe, if you're still hanging on, it's kind of late there, don't know what a onesie is. Uh, the the kids, the small children, you put them in these like pajama th- sets. Uh, the the true onesies have feet in them and everything, and you stick their arms in, their legs in it, and you zip them up in the front, and it's like one piece of clothing that covers the whole body. They call them onesies, and they're trying to do these for adults now and sell these things, and people are supposed to be like walking around in these and going to work. But they are. <laughs> they are. They're, people are telling me about these fur onesies. And, you know, their designer onesies and stuff. It makes me think about in the 70s when they were wearing those um, those single jumper suits that oh. had like the one zipper that went up the thigh and all the way across the chest. Oh, uh, what they call it? They weren't jogging suits. They were something leisure. No, it wasn't a leisure suit. I know I what you remember. Remember I- Mr. Roper on uh Facts of Life, or no, not Facts of Life, but Three's Company. Right. Uh, Mr. Roper, the Don Knox character, Mm -hmm. used to wear them. Oh, yeah. Dude, I... I knew a guy that wore those. He was an older gentleman, and he they were like his favorites were like baby blue. They they even had like a built-in little belt on them. Yes. (laughs) From the front. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he loved him. He would and he would actually go out. He was wearing his his one piece baby blue thing, and uh, I forget what they're called. And he, he had white loafers. 
Yeah, they were. Were they worse. called leisures? No, you said leisures. Dang it. Now this is going to drive leash me nuts. was a polyester thing. It was like pants and like this polyester uh, jacket. And people, it all matched. It was like a vest and a coat and the pants. Exactly. It's like somebody escaped from a prom from like a high right. school. <laughs> and then, but they wouldn't wear wouldn't wear ties with them. It was, it was casual. You just wear an open collar, and the collars were like huge, you know, like Elvis Presley collars. They were like four inches long. Oh, um, a jumpsuit. A jumpsuit. That's it. A it was, jumpsuit. That's it. Yeah. So so all of these different cycles, all these different fads, you know, you create a new one, and then you you give. You give a, a, and I'm generalizing here, an addictive society another choice where they're so discombobulated because there's so many different shiny objects to choose from. How can, you know, how can I pick? What do I pick? You know, and then, and then if I pick this, what is Billy Bob or Joe going to say about it? And then if, if, if I don't get enough likes or if I don't get enough comments or if i don't make the right status my whole world could implode you know and and there's this on netflix there's this tv series you know as i talk about being a hypocrite in netflix um it's called black window and um one of their episodes is about you you get the social status by people and how they comment on you and like you and everybody knows your number or your rating. And it's basically breaking the whole social norms of you can't have anybody who's like below a 285. You know, and if you have this rating of a 692, you couldn't talk to anybody who is below a 615. You know, and you basically could social network yourself out of existence. Mm. Dude, I have a rating of four. That's crazy. Oh, man. I tell you what, the people, uh, we, when I say the people, I'm talking about me included. We are all in this together. I tell you what, uh, you were talking about the clothing. We we're talking about the leisure suits and the jumpsuits and the onesies. You know, if you were going to time travel, I've got the perfect outfit for time traveling. Now, this would be near end time travel. Let's say if you wanted today, you know, here we are, September 14, 2017. I've got something that you could wear, and if you got into a time machine, you could go back any day, any month, any year, all the way back to like 19, uh, probably like 55, and you would be safe. And you know mm -hmm. what that is? You could, if you put on a pair of Levi jeans, a pair of Chuck Taylor high tops, black or good to wear, and a black t-shirt, dude, you mm -hmm. could get time machine literally think about it and you could go you could go any decade and you would fit and you could walk down the street and no one would look at you twice wearing a black t-shirt a pair of levi's and a pair of black high top chuck taylors all the way from right now all the way back to the 1950s and not you would not stand out it's like the perfect cover for time travel you know and you know about the onesies and stuff like that I, I don't mean to make fun of Jerome in the chat room because I, I've heard it's his favorite choice of clothing, uh, the onesies. So I, I mean no disrespect if that's what you choose to wear, you know. So so please, Joan, don't don't take offense on that one. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> don't wanna, my question I have, did the onesies have a flap in the back? <laughs> <Wait. laughs> Long underwear. Oh my God! Yeah, that was but, Grandpa. Um, we as uh, human beings, and you know where this is all prompted from? They have to continually sell things, and so they push this fashion on TV or whatever. And you can make people say, or think, or desire anything. It's a science, man. This is a science, and this has changed. I've talked about this before. It used to be in in the early part of the last century, a product was sold for its worth, for what it was, you know, like a biscuit, a biscuit mix was the best biscuit mix because it made good tasty biscuits that were flaky. 
and they were it was easy to mix and that was what it was sold on something happened what happened was in new york city in the ad agencies they they had to get a different twist on this so they started equating products with success love um you know social status and so all of a sudden it, it from going from you know this buttermilk biscuit tastes the best it went from this buttermilk biscuit will go will lead you to a man's love he will love you for this biscuit your family nine out of ten housewives prefer biscuits by bob's in the morning <laughs> yeah yeah because biscuits from bob's make your husband happy and he goes off to work happy and healthy and comes home with flowers you know and and they equated all these products automobiles clothing whatever with um sexuality with um being smart with being accepted being popular and they still do that and you know dude they've even extended that to drugs i like watching the drug commercials because they're so surreal <laughs> with the new drug of the month and they're constantly changing them and then when they go out of fad they go to the lawyer side and then they start running the advertisements like did you or a loved one, you know, have this happen to you on this drug? You may be entitled to a settlement. And so they cycle them through to the doctors and patients and then to the lawyers. And the thing about it is, though, they always show this imagery of people happy. Oh, they're meeting in the, the market. They're hugging their kids. Or, oh, this and the l- guy in the lab coat. Oh, yeah. They, they're just so happy, right? And... They're just so blessed. But in the background, they're talking about the side effects of these, you know, how horrible they are. But it's, again, it's marketing. It's marketing. It's like, hey, you know, I love going to baseball games with my, you know, with my friends. And I love hanging out with my buddies. Oh, maybe if I get this heart medication, I can do that. And they really psychologically mess with people to get people to ask for these drugs. At their Dr. Doctor Dr. Robert Beck in his um, his video, um, Suppressed Medical Discoveries, he said it best when he said, uh, when you go into a pharmacist and you see all of these over-the-counter drugs and all of them have their little niche to it of why you should take them, he said, if any one of them worked, there wouldn't be any others. Sure. And that's... And that's basically, as you were stating, there was a testament of time when the product itself, either you bought it or you didn't, because the product itself was the testament of time. Now we are so coerced with the visual stimulation, the the noise stimulation, the verbal, you know, all these stimulations of the advertisement. And if anybody has done research in mk ultra you would realize mk ultra its subtext is not just mind control but behavior modification because if they can nudge you just enough to get you off your daily routine then they've success they've they've, they've successfully brought chaos into your world Because when our, you know, you want to make the creator laugh, tell them your plans. So true. You know, they ran into a problem, though, and they actually kind of messed something up. They overlapped their goal on a couple of issues. It kind of of, uh, screwed them up. And what that was was, you know, with the onset of psychotropic drugs and the Ritalin and things like that to control the classroom, and basically make kids like drones so they wouldn't act out. You know, no more punishment. Just give them, oh, they're uh, ADD. So give them, you know, ADHD, give them this drug. And what they've done, they started drugging the population at a younger and younger level and make it acceptable that kids are on drugs and teenagers are on drugs and young adults are on drugs. Then what happened was their behavioral mod- modification uh, technique that they were using to promote you know, civil unrest to get agendas pushed and all that, failing. They were like, wait a minute. We used to be able to get people in the streets and get them activated. What's happened? Um, I'm Excuse sorry. me, Phoenix. 
Did uh, you just hit your uh, volume on your mic? Because you just dropped and it came in and out a little bit on your sound. Is my sound still fine? Now, your sound's good. How's my oh, Now sound? you're back. Okay. You're that's back. Hmm. What are we discussing here that's upsetting someone? <laughs> Very odd. I didn't hit mm-hmm. anything there. Very unusual. Okay. Yeah, well, what I was talking about was they have an overlap and they've kind of messed themselves up because they were prescribing all of these psychotropic drugs and control drugs like Ritalin and all this for ADHD to control classrooms and kids and make them basically like drones so they wouldn't act out or whatever. And they were very successful with that and made billions of dollars off of that. The teachers were very happy about that. And you basically ended up with, um, you know, a population of people who are very easily controlled. But what happens when they needed them to get hit the streets they were realizing they had a problem because they couldn't incite the type of reaction like they did in the sixties where they got tens and tens of thousands of young people out in the street protesting and tearing things up. They tried it. They tried to push it, but they couldn't because people are so drugged now that they can't get them out there. The only way they can get them out there is if they promise them money, if they pay them, the kids are like, Oh, okay, I'll go then. I, you know, I can use a few few hundred bucks. So, you know, the drugging the drugging technique they've used on the population kind of messed them up. Well, it's it's back to the and sometimes I feel like we're we're being downers, you know, as we point out this the the reality of it and stuff. And it goes back to this preconditioning by the powers that shouldn't be. And how do we escape these bonds, these chains of what they're doing? I mean, consciously being aware of them is, you know, part of it, acknowledging it is. But what do we do within our own world to, to break free? That comes from inner discipline and this is what okay this brings us full circle back we're not being downers on this what we're talking about what you were pointing out was this energetic you were picking up and this leads us right back to the eclipse time and the warnings that we were putting out to everyone that you really got to watch what you're thinking don't be caught up on all this i mean you read the headlines tonight north korea missile you know this that the other blah 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 you know they they try to really get people caught up in fear and we, we have real live things that are happening that have caused a lot of fear with people like the two massive um, hurricane events here in the United States, the uh, giant typhoon event over in uh, Hong Kong and the other events that happen all around the world. People get, you know, very challenged by this. It's very stressful. And many people died. But what we're witnessing here, Nay say, is an amping up and a ramping up of the very thing that we were cautious cautioning people on before the eclipse and up to the eclipse and that was say no to fear and watch what you think how you think it and what your intentions are because we have gone through that portal we've gone through that point and it's all starting to pick up right now and people who you interacted with this weekend maybe were very very unaware with that of that like most people were and they actually went through that eclipse not really mindful of much of anything other than you know the day-to-day things or basic desires and fearful thoughts anyway i fear that we've come up on a break we'll be right back after this break don't go away anyone Your protection from, 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 from deception. This is Truth Frequency Radio.
Welcome to Phoenix Rising Radio. Now is the time to lift your mind higher. Now is the time to rise above. I am your host, Phoenix, and welcome to tonight's broadcast. And welcome back to the second hour here at Phoenix Rising Radio, right here on Truth Frequency Radio, where truth is premier. Are you a supporter of the truth? I hope so. If not, go over to truthfrequencyradio.com. Find out how you can be a supporter of the truth and have access to high-definition downloads of not only Phoenix Rising Radio, but all the great and fantastic hosts right here on Truth Frequency Radio. Yeah. Anyway, before the break, we were talking about these energetics that we're dealing with. Yeah, there's a lot of big news out there tonight about World War III fears rise as Kim Jong-un fires a missile again in the direction of Japan. Uh, I haven't seen the details exactly where it landed. But, you know, here's the problem that people are facing is that they have miniaturized nuclear weapons. They can load them onto missiles and every time these guys shoot a missile off, no one's really for sure what's in it and what direction it's going to go. So it placed the United States in quite a position. And China, like we were saying earlier in the last hour, and they say China and Russia have North Korea's back, no matter what anyone says. And China put out an unusual statement, too. It said something to the effect that if you know, they wanted the United States to refrain from a first strike, because if they did, if the United States does an unprovoked first strike, it would be seen as a um, provocation that was uncalled for and China would come to North Korea's aid. But China also told North Korea not to do the same because that would be unprovoked. So China's playing the big boy here, you know, with a big stick saying anybody who jumps first we're on the other person's team so that's that's quite a quandary and i think it's a pretty smart thing for china to do actually because it keeps both sides from striking out first but right away with you know with my uh cynicism it's like okay are they just creating another boogeyman is this just a boogeyman just like saddam was Gaddafi was hitler yada 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 they got to have a boogeyman in order for them to perpetuate the course action well yeah of course that's it's an economic model it's a horrible economic model but it's what's been in existence for centuries because kings long ago realized like hey you know if i it's very costly to, to wage a war you know in, in cost of gold silver materials and uh, men <laughs> it's very costly but if i win said war Hmm, I can gain much, much more. And so it's an economic gambit. And then it turned into like a huge biz- business, war boom bust. You know, after World War II, the United States went through a an economic burst like had never been seen in this nation before. It was incredible. Uh, after, you know, the, the, the boom, it's after World War II, that's where baby boomers came from. There were so many children born. Everybody had houses and this whole economic model of everybody had a car and a house and, and all this stuff. And, and that was all prompted because of the money that was flowing because during the war, and here's how the model works. If a nation goes to war, primarily in the United States, this is how the model works is failing now they would send out all these men all the able-bodied men would be you know drafted or join and what that would immediately do is deplete the workforce therefore opening up jobs to everybody else maybe someone is slightly disabled couldn't you know couldn't get a job before and couldn't be in the military guess what now they're working in a factory guess what now they're building things and then all the women come into the workforce rosie the riveter you know building for victory and what happens is all that economic burst of growth that goes to the companies down to the people then that spurs 
all the other things. They're out buying clothing. They're out going to the uh, to the movies. You know, they're buying records or doing all these things for the entertainment industry. So the entire economy booms. And then when the everybody came back from World War II, you know, we had the spoils of war, basically. And it was a great thing. And that lasted for a while. But then it started to, like, run out. And they're like, oh, man, we need to keep this going. And then they tried with a few other models. And uh, the Korean War didn't work out too well. We're still dealing with that tonight. Um, that was a disaster. Then we had the Vietnam War, which is even a bigger disaster, but they did secure some of the Golden, tri uh, golden Triangle heroin out of that. Um, then they realized those models didn't work. Then we went to the new model, the Gulf War model with the corporations. And that's when the big money started flowing, man. You know, corporations like Blackwater and all these other dozens of private security forces, I mean, Eric Prince became a billionaire from this. You know, he's a former Navy SEAL. And then you have uh, Kellogg, Brown, and Root, and all these huge companies. Halliburton. Halliburton, all of these making huge money. I mean, it is such a boon to the economy. The Gulf War, that's why it went on so, so freaking long. And also Afghanistan. We talked about the heroin poppies there. Oh, by the way, I'm still curious to see if Trump's going to burn down the poppy fields. What do you think, bro? I thought he already did. Wasn't yeah. it like 90 days into office he, he went in there and burnt him down? No. Now, you, you know what I'm talking about because they just said uh, they're going to increase the troop presence there. And a lot of people are like, hey, man, he's going back on his pledge. But I was speculating that possibly if he went in there, he would do exactly that, start burning down the poppy fields because that would hit the deep state right in the wallet. Well, my my speculation on it is that, you know, since the beginning when he – first went in there and allegedly bombed all of those those old tunnels i think that's when they went in there and they burnt all the poppy fields and my belief is that they still haven't the drug lords over there still haven't disputed on who's running the show and so they're gonna have to send military in there to just make sure that they pick a leader so they can get the uh get the heroin up and running again no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to to dispute that one because the fields are still there. They did not burn the poppy fields down. Yeah, they did some specific strikes. They hit some tunnels and things, but they still have not addressed the issue of the, the massive amount of poppy fields there. That basically now employs like one third of all the civilian population economically in Afghanistan. So that's really got to be addressed because that is the deep state money. That is a big money maker right there for the deep state. And this will be the true tell. Is Donald Trump the person that people think he is who who supported him? Is he really going after the deep state? Is he really the one to drain the swamp? Well, here we go. He just called for and authorized over 4,000 new troops to go into Afghanistan. And if we do not see evidence or reports, positive evidence and reports that they went after those poppy fields and shut them down then he's not the guy you think he is because those poppy fields don't need to be there and we talked about this before those poppy fields were destroyed by the Taliban before 9-11 before we went in there they had totally eradicated poppy growth in Afghanistan because they said it was immoral but then after we went in and we attacked Afghanistan surprise the largest crop ever in the history of Afghanistan it's increased every year since then 16 years. Well, just that the opium trade in itself and hashish, you know, when you when you look through the history of like the opening of the Silk Road, you know, and Marco Polo and, you know, opening trade with China and China and their opium, you know, they claim it, they called it the Silk Road, you know, but a lot of it was for the hashish and the opium. Well, that's an, I'm glad you brought that up because we're looking at a situation right now where China is doing the Belt and Road. It's a new Silk Road, the modern Silk Road. It's a massive, massive infrastructure project that reaches all across Asia into Europe and will affect nations all around the world. Now, part of that road will go through Afghanistan. They cannot. They cannot have that, 
that massive new infrastructure project, Rolling Field Place, is being run by drug lords. And it's, it's the primary um, source of heroin in the world because the new Silk Road project would turn into a massive drug running project um, that they would have to police and patrol and it'd be a disaster. So I, I have a hunch that she, the leader of China and Trump, may be on the same sheet of music with this one, and we will. I still have hope. We'll see a destruction of the opium poppy fields in Afghanistan and cutting off all that cheap heroin, which is a scourge to the world, truly is. Well, it's great at making money for the elitist because where's most of the money but drugs, guns, and human bodies? True, true. In the, in the underworld, you know, but, but I can't imagine most governments have dealings with the underworld stuff, would they? Oh, yeah. Anyway, you know, here, and here's the trick to all this. What are we going to see? What are we going to be seeing here in the future? A lot of people were, was thinking that this uh, Korean War thing has been averted. Nah, far from it, man. This thing is ongoing. And, you know, I talk about occasionally my matrix of information. And one of those parts of the matrix, the lesser part is the other. And that has to do with prophecy, writings, dreams, rumors, whatever. Things like that that are you know, not solid and therefore being a lesser degree. But there have been some prophecies, particularly one by this dude from South Korea. Oh, no. Uh, South Africa. I can't remember his name right now. Long black beard. and Anyway, he used to go around to different nations and stuff, and he would prophesy to have these dreams. And he would go, when he'd have these dreams, go to these churches in these nations and tell them. And he had a pretty good success record. I mean, he went to New Orleans before Katrina. He went to Haiti before the earthquake and, and other places. Some of them haven't been fulfilled yet, but many of them have. And he particularly went to South Korea. Said he saw a dream. He had a dream. And in this dream, he saw trucks with missiles on them. And these missiles were firing into South Korea from North Korea. And all these tanks and trucks rolled across the border. And he saw a missile and missiles fall on ships at sea. And it was an aircraft carrier, a United States aircraft carrier. And it sank. And he saw this dream. And he said it was going to be a horrific war where millions of people would die. So, and that was like, that was years ago. That, he put that out. That was before uh, Kim Jong-un was doing all this stuff. And um, so I, I keep that in, the, in, in, in my mind as a possibility. And that's not being fearful. See, that's the thing. We, you know, you have to be able to proactively navigate this existence with the, the least amount of fear that you can, but we will constantly be surrounded with fearful things. Saying no to fear and having a good mindset doesn't mean all of a sudden, oh, look, there's a rainbow with a unicorn and, and little bunnies everywhere. It doesn't happen that way. Keeping your, your <laughs> mind positive uh, enables you to be the strongest person that you can be and to function well and to be happy and to help influence those around you. Because I will guarantee you, I don't care how positive you are, I don't care how much you can manifest or how well you can meditate or pray or how close you are to, to the spirit side, you will be surrounded by warfare and, and sorrows in this world. We are not going to change that because the unfortunate truth in this is that we are all co-creators. I had a, a woman get kind of like in an argument with me one time. I was talking about some things. She goes, you have to top, stop talking about that Phoenix. That You stop. Why are you doing that? I'm like, because uh, it's going on. She goes, don't you know we're co-creators? And and we could, I'm like, yeah, I know that. I realize that. You know, and I, I tried to explain to her that you we can be as positive as we can for ourselves and for those around us and the world. But you have to realize that everybody co everybody creates 
even if they're not conscious. And some people consciously do it, and there's some evil son of a bees out there. And there's some people out there who want bad stuff to happen. And, yeah, they, they co-create also. They're looking for it. There are people out there that are slathering. Man, they are just like, can't wait until there's a war. I mean, this is their business. This is their livelihood. There's almost like a demonic bloodlust uh, within them. They're, they're on the evil side who, who want to see death. They want to see destruction. And that's a reality of our existence. It's not being negative. It's being for real. It's being for real. I mean, you well, that, can't. Go ahead. That was one of the things that drove me from Minneapolis. And when I went down to this outdoor festival, we have to go through Minneapolis. And there's over a million people people in Minneapolis and when I was living there in 98 and they were talking about Y2K I was sharing with a friend of mine and we're sitting around talking about Y2K and two of his buddies come over and they were kind of a little questionable characters and uh, my buddy asked me to share with them about Y2K and when I shared it with them their first response was like, that would be awesome if there wasn't any cops or no laws because we could kill who we wanted. And oh. my mouth just dropped, you know, because for someone who's barely able to walk and having to utilize a wheelchair to get around, I'm thinking, I'm a victim. And there's no way I want to be in a city where there's over a million people and be a victim. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and see, that's what people have to realize. And this is the problem that a lot of people who are spiritually inclined uh, run into because, you know, this people, for the most part, are good. And people, for the most part, I believe, I hope, are of a stance that they have a conscience still. But there is a large population, percentage of population, with no conscience. And to them, because we've lost a lot of moral backing in this nation and the world, um, the only evil is to get caught. They truly believe they can do anything they want as long as they don't get caught. And if they get caught, that's a bad thing. But doing something bad isn't bad if they don't get caught, especially if it, it helps them. Oh, look, I scored a new CD. Oh, look, I got this. Oh, look at the money I have now. Oh, look at the new girlfriend I have. Oh, look at the new boyfriend I have. All on the, on the, on the, from the result of doing something immoral, you know, absolutely, cheating, you know, whatever, lying. And they're just no conscience at all. I mean, literally no conscience because they haven't been taught to have a conscience and well, they don't know right from wrong. Well, this is what I absolutely experienced with this weekend at the festival because the other reason I go down there is because they allow me to put up my cannabis resolution booth where I have a mini museum, you know, with cannabis byproducts. And I have to hire a crew, you know, to come there and help me out. And the majority of the times the experiences I have is that people want to get the hugest reward possible for the least amount of work and i ponder can i really fault fault them for this mentality when you look at our politicians and you look at our leaders where they're in these cushy jobs doing the minimal amount of work and reaping the best rewards you know and it's almost like people have gotten sick and tired of you know the fact that we're working ourselves to the ground and not getting out of the hole. And, and that was another thing that I, I experienced is not only the challenges, as I stated earlier, but the fact that people were so emotional that they would explain to me the challenges that they were going through. And I was having people that would start break down crying because of the the challenges they're going through. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is evidence of the thing I've been talking about. We're going to see more of that, man. We're going to see people breaking down. And the reason for that is people don't have survival skills. And when I say survival skills, 
I'm not talking about how to build a fire or, you know, find north through the stars or all of this stuff. I'm talking about basic spiritual and intellectual survival st- skills. People don't know how to lift themselves up, you know, on their own and to to strengthen themselves and to have faith. People have no faith. And because they do not have a Polaris or North Star of guidance in their life spiritually, they are constantly lost and fearful. They don't know. They don't have the skills uh, to comfort themselves, to, to convince themselves they're strong enough to get through something, or also the very basic skill of knowing that our mind, our attitude, and our spirit can set the direction, tone, and change things. It's how we manifest things. That's how it happens. It's it's the unseen. And because they don't have this skill, they'll have these problems that come at them, they say, and they will see them as insurmountable. They will see them, they will look at the problem instead of like visualizing the solution or giving it up to a higher power, to God because they don't have that faith, and they are overcome by small things because they can't deal with them. Let's say, you know, <clears throat> if, I, if I gave you a, a stone, you know, small stones, like, hey, and they say, check this out, and you looked at it, but you really weren't sure what to do with it. Oh, should I throw this down, or he gave this to me, should I hang on to it? I don't know what I should do. Should I put it in my pocket? I don't know. And then I'm like, hey, check this one out. And I give you another one. You're like, oh, thanks. Oh, what do I do? I don't know. Oh, hey, look at this one. You know, like, we're walking along a riverbed, <clears throat> and I was doing that. You being a, a balanced person would say, oh, that's cool. I like that one. You might say, oh, I'm going to keep this one. And you say, look at this one, and you throw it as I give you the other one. But if you don't know how to do that, and you don't know how to deal with things, the next thing you know, you've got so much in your hands, you can't even hold it. It's so heavy. And that's what's happening with, with people, is they're over, being overcome by small things, and they don't know how to deal with these individual small things to it gets to the point they're like covered in rubble of problems. And, and it's insurmountable by their own creation because they can't react, they can't deal with it, and they don't know how to let things go and to set their mind on the proper course. And that's what I'm trying to tell everyone about this evening, and I have been trying to tell everyone about for weeks now since the eclipse about really watching your thoughts, man. We have got to watch our thoughts. If we, you know, Here's a good example. If we wake up tomorrow morning and find out that North Korea – launched a nuclear weapon and it hit Japan and ships are mobilizing and Trump's on TV and Tillerson's like riding a tricycle around the white house, you know, with guns, you know, <laughs> all the craziness, whatever, you know, you have got to be able to take that information and say, okay, how does this affect me right now? You have to be able to deal with it and say, no, I'm not going to be fearful in this. And you, you have to know that, you know, that no matter what the world throws at us, we can turn it around and we can be victorious in this. This is a skill people have to learn, and I'm, it's going to be vital, dude, because it's going to get worse. Well, that goes with, you know, I will never tell you not to feel your feelings, you know, but I would I would strongly suggest you realize that when you act upon feelings, you don't act with a lot of self-control and when you when you can acknowledge your feelings and if you have the appropriate amount of time or if you feel like you have the moments to where you can sit with those feelings then by all means but in a situation of where it's fight or flight you have to try to suppress those emotions and so you can make the most accurate movement. Mm-hmm. That's true. You you do have to control that. And that's another case right there where you're talking about for dealing with things and being being able to deal with them. And the problem we've reached in society today is that people aren't allowed to feel. Oh, kid's angry. Oh, you have anger issues. You, you need this drug. Uh, oh, what's wrong with you? Oh, I don't feel good. I'm sad about this. Oh, you're depressed. You need this drug. And what happens is they are suppressing, artificially suppressing natural human emotions by drugs, 
to control people. And what happens is it never gets dealt with. And so these these core issues of, of sadness, fear, or, you know, um, anger are never dealt with properly because they're drugged and they dope up people in the head. And then you, you create a huge problem and people can't deal with this stuff. You know, the, the, the days of people being depressed and getting over it, and those are over. Those are over. Now, if you're like, oh, I feel a little depressed, people are like, oh, my God, you've got to go to the doctor. Now, no, I don't. I'm a little bit depressed. Oh, have, have, you, have you got any medication? No. See, because that's how I do it. I used to get depressed. I don't like angry about something. I'm like, oh, man, it bums me out. You know what I'd do? Dude, I would embrace it. I would sit down I'm like, oh, boom. What's wrong with you? Nah, I'm depressed. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. And I would just sit there and I would think about it and I would process this. And sometimes I'd be like that for like a few hours. I'm like, okay. And then I'd get over myself. I'm like, yeah, I'm done with that. And I'd get up and go away. And it was over. Real people. Real radio. Wherever you are. Make it TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Something happening here But what it is ain't exactly clear There's a man with a gun over there Telling me I got to beware I think it's time we stop Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down Here we are, once again, segment number four at the Phoenix Rising on Truth Frequency. Thank you very much for being here. Shangri-La, Shangri-La, on the road to Shangri-La, whether it's literally, metaphorically, spiritually, emotionally, when you can find that oneness, that Shangri-La within yourself, it's a lot easier to deal with what's going on. And if there's one way to uh, find Shangri-La is uh, follow, follow Phoenix because Phoenix knows how to get there. Phoenix knows how to get there. I'm, I'm still headed there. I will let you know when I get there. This is a journey. We're constantly traveling because Shangri-La is constantly expanding and retracting within us. It's within Peace and joy, heaven, the kingdom of heaven is within. And that's where we find it. It's, you won't find it from outward stimulation, from drugs, from alcohol, from this this woman, that man, whatever. You know, this bobble, this toy, this car. That's not where happiness is. I mean, yeah, we find joy and comfort in, in things and friends and th- stuff like that. But if you're not comfortable in your own skin and comfortable inside and at peace, None of it's any good. If you don't believe that's true, how many people have you seen who have committed suicide, taken their own lives, who had it all? Successful, handsome, beautiful, wealthy. They had it. They had it all. And they ended their own life because they didn't find that peace. They were constantly searching on the outside. Anyway, back to what's going on in the world today. And some of these things we're going to have to deal with and they're going to, you know, amplify and start kicking up. The North Korea thing during the break, I was checking a little bit of the detail out. It's all new info that's coming out. They believe it was a range test. And we mentioned this in the other segment that they believe what they did was they fired this at a specific range with possibly a dummy warhead in it to see if indeed they could reach Guam because the range is sufficient to accurately strike Guam. Now, Guam is an island nation out, uh, I don't even know if it's an island nation, (laughs) if the U.S. actually took control of Guam. It was an island in the Pacific that the United States basically came in and took over, and that's where we have a lot of our nuclear fighters and strike fighters are based in Guam. And, you know, um, Korea has been, North Korea has been saying that they will strike Guam and they could do this. Now, will they? I don't know. But these are things we have to be aware 
aware of the uh, situation with North Korea. We do have another hurricane out in the Atlantic Ocean. Jose, we talked a little bit about this last week, but it looks like some of the models, most of the models are showing this thing going a little northward, uh, maybe like a Category 1 and just dying out in the ocean. But there are, be advised, there are a couple models, the Canadian model and the Navy model, which are actually showing this thing making landfall up around uh, the New York area, possibly. And that would be somewhere like Tuesday, Wednesday of this coming week, if that happens. Now, there's a very low degree of probability of that happening. Again, the multiple models show uh, the percentages, 80 percentages, 80 percent of them show them show this hurricane not amounting to anything. But that's still out there. And again, these things aren't uh, things to be fearful of. These are realities that we're facing in this existence, in this world. It's a challenge in life school that we all have to deal with. So this is something that we could potentially see. We could wake up and see basically all heck is broken loose in the world concerning North Korea. Now, would they do this? Would they pull this off? I have no idea. The The psychology behind this and how deep the deep state is in all of this is you know, an unknown factor to me. People can speculate about it. You can read about it. But then you have some uh, religious things coming up, too. Now, I'm going to talk next week, and they say, about this uh, – what they're calling the September 23rd sign in the sky, the Revelation 12 sign that happens next Saturday. Not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday on the 23rd. And that's the day after the equinox. And, um, you know, we'll be rolling into autumn. I love autumn. It's my favorite season, by the way, here in the Northern Hemisphere. I absolutely love it, dude. Um, Anyway, this this uh, November, I mean, September 23rd time, we'll discuss it in more detail next week because a lot of people have some strange beliefs about this and um, they use this. What I'm saying is the powers that be, the entities will use these energetics that people are whipping up within themselves um, to their control and to, for their uses. So be aware of all this. We're, we're, we're hitting kind of a peak time here where they like to pull off shenanigans. And the United States, the United States, if you're a, a reader at Going Global East Meets West blogspot.com, you'd be very aware of the fact that the petrodollar system is over. China has gone to, is going to officially a gold-backed yuan currency, and nations are going to be trading oil in this gold back you want and other currencies and the u.s is on the out and out so there are powers that be that will do everything they can to keep that system going and so we're kind of in a dangerous time knowing this just be prepared to the best you can be but more important than uh, beans bullets and band-aids is your mindset your mindset and your heart would you agree with that naysay well, absolutely. And if you if you want to just ponder of how quickly a change can be and and unprepared, you know, with the hurricanes and just with up here in the north, we just had a 40 degree weather change where we had 90 degree weather for the last two days. And today we're I think we got in uh, 54 degrees. I oh. think we got to the high today, maybe a little bit higher than that. But it's it's utterly beyond the norm, you know, but it is the norm in itself because things oscillate. They go from one extreme to the other, and sometimes they exponentially go wrong or go right. And this goes with the whole thing of Bill Hicks, and it's only a ride. Sometimes you got the big high climb on the roller coaster and the big plunge. And then you have a couple little little humps to go over, you mm -hmm. know. But but that's you know, where do you where do you find your tears? Where do you find your tears? Where are you looking for your tears? Are you looking for tears of fear, or are you looking for tears of joy? Tears of joy. I'll take tears of joy for twenty days. Eh? Have you ever had bison jerky? Phoenix? 
Yes, I have. It's very good. They actually, we have some bison farms around here. Bison, by the way, is my favorite meat. I like bison. <laughs> bison. Well, I, we, no, why? I bring it up because on the way back to the Twin Cities, we stopped at this place called the Wedge Co-op. I've been a member since 1991, and they have this bison jerky, peppered bison jerky. And as I've said before, I'm not supposed to be eating nightshade families because it wreaks havoc and causes more inflammation. But I am a hypocrite, and I love my peppered bison jerky. And I apologize that during the show, my daughter came in and said a piece of peppered bison jerky next to me and i've been taking little nibbles off it and i've been i've been really trying not to just shove the whole piece in my mouth and not be able to talk for 15 minutes but yeah uh, i love i love jerky i used to make a lot of jerky matter of fact i was looking at my dehydrator today i haven't made jerky in years but i always made venison jerky every year and Dude, you'll never, you, you won't believe this, but it's true. One year I took a deer, the whole deer. A friend of mine called me up. He goes, man, he goes, I just filled my tag out. And, uh, he goes, my freezer's full. He goes, you, you want a deer? I'm like, sure. And, um, it was a buck. He brought it over. It was, it was just uh, field dress. And I'm like, okay, let me take care of this. And so I, I dress, finished dressing this thing out and, Ended up cutting the entire deer up into thin slices, and I made jerky out of the whole deer. I am not kidding you. Not like one roast. I mean, I did the whole thing, even the back straps, everything, man. I made uh, jerked a whole deer. I had these big containers of jerky, and I did like a teriyaki, and or uh, one was a teriyaki, one was like um, a soy based, and uh, you know pepper. Just a little bit of sugar, not much, but yeah, I love jerky, and uh, well, bison is good too. Well, just bringing it up as we're talking about preparedness, preparedness, you know, nothing keeps like jerky does. <laughs> uh, the pemmican, pemmican keeps much longer than jerky. Pemmican is um, a food that the Native Americans loved, and so did the American. American settlers, because it was um, something it kept for years, literally, and it's made from beef uh, suet or uh, deer suet, but primarily beef, and which is like a rendered fat, and dried meat, either buffalo or venison, beef, and you take the dried beef, unseasoned, and grind it up almost into like a powder. They do it in a mortar and pestle. And you'd add some berries to it, usually like dried blueberries. And you mix the berries and the meat and the suet, and you'd mix it in. This Don't consistent. forget the wild rice. You can put so, wild rice in. There's a lot of I different. make them into little patties. Mm-hmm. You can do that with the wild rice. Some people put nuts in them. I've heard you shouldn't put the nuts because the, the oil's going to go rancid. I don't know. But there's different recipes for pemmican, and it lasts a long time. And it's a high, high-energy food, man. The caloric output uh, and content of pemmican is incredible. Well, the, the biggest thing that was such a factor in that is that it was so broken down already that your body could easily digest it and absorb it. And that's one of the things that where they say with the whole thing of eating meat, you know, eating meat isn't so bad if you take the time to chew it and you chew it in the small micro bites so that your body can absorb it. You know, more times than not, we're hastily eating our food and not even tasting it, where it's just chew, chew, swallow, chew, chew, swallow. Are you chew, chewing, swallowing right now? Are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you're dying to eat that jerky. That's funny. No, my mouth, my, I had a piece during the break, and my mouth is literally salivating because I'm just, uh, you know, I'm not a big meat eater. Yeah. I, I actually fasted last week, you know, because of the Equinox. And, uh, yeah, we picked up this bison jerky, and it's just delicious. 
Wow. So I, I apologize in advance if That's you okay. guys have heard me a couple times nibbling nope. on it. It's just amazing that it's right there so close to you. And you're so <laughs> thanks. You really want some? I bet it is so good. You probably smell it. In fact, I bet your daughter is like eating a piece slowly right in front of you. Like this is so good, Dad. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, they're they're worse than I am. They actually, when they heard I went to the wedge, the first question they asked is if I got any bison jerky. You know, and it's it's a wonderful source. You know, take some time research bison, the bison meat. Some people call it buffalo. If that's inaccurate in description, but bison, buffalo, very good, very, um, the fat content is a lot better for you. And the way that most bisons are red or bred or raised that supposedly the, the emotional impact of the animal besides its death is minimal comparatively to the cattle farming and how they're kept in high numbers and close quarters and mm -hmm. we should do some uh we should do some more uh uh health stuff besides uh with bob i sh actually i should come on with you and bob again because i keep meaning to get a hold of him and asking him some question and uh the the website is a wealth of information yeah he should be on next thursday maybe you can do that come on next thursday um, he, of course he had to evacuate. They're back in business now down in, in Florida, St. Petersburg there, but, um, and they lucked out. Dude, did you see, oh, I'm sorry, you're blind. Did you, <laughs> <laughs> did you hear about like the bays, uh, or, during the hurricane Harvey and this phenomenon had happened down in South America, but during the hurricane in a couple of places, one of the islands and on the West coast and also on the on the east coast the entire ocean just like disappeared and it was like sucked up into the storm tampa bay which is this huge bay in between st petersburg and tampa was totally drained and people were like walking out in tampa bay on on the the floor of the ocean they did it over on uh on near fort lauderdale also and Miami just like went out and they say the, the, the storm was so intense and no one had ever seen that before who's witnessed many hurricanes have seen this, but dude, I, I'm telling you, I saw video of this as far as the eye could see the ocean was gone, gone. Wow. That must be an incredible sight to witness, especially if you live there. Yeah, and when you you notice that this this hurricane and its motion and stuff was yeah. so fast that it just sucked, yeah, the shallow waters up. Yeah, and this was before the hurricane got there, and this really helped out. The reason I brought this up because we're talking about Bob and Boomers his business in St. Petersburg. They were forecasting a storm surge in the St. Petersburg, Tampa area of five to ten feet, which would have totally destroyed the city. But and it was going to happen during a high tide also. But what happened to these areas like down Miami and St. Petersburg and, and Tampa that were supposed to get these massive storm surges, the ocean sucked away. And by the time the surge came, it just like brought it up to the normal level. It was just like a strange phenomenon, almost like there was like some type of supernatural help with all this because of those Areas of ocean had not receded, had not disappeared in a, a like almost a miracle type fashion. Oh, let me let me say this one thing. When I did see this and witness this, and they were talking about it, what came to mind was when the Israelites, the story of them escaping from the Egyptians and going across the Red Sea, because it says and God parted the waters and they walked on the on the on the bottom of the sea to the other side, and people were like, oh well, that's a pretty crazy story. Dude, it just happened here, here in the United States and Florida. And literally, if the ocean would not have gone wherever it did, they say it went up into the storm. If it would have stayed at its, at the normal level, when that storm surge would have hit Miami, Fort Lauderdale, all around the entire tip of, my, of, of Florida, all the way up, would have been just really hit hard. Now, a lot of areas were like under 15 feet of water in some of these lower areas, but it could have been devastatingly worse with the loss of life and, and infrastructure damage. So whatever happened with that, but that was just a bizarre thing. And because of that, again, full circle, Bob's in business 
and uh, they're manning the phones and sending orders out. You know, there's there's one thing being in the Navy and seeing the absolute power of the ocean. Nothing is more humbling than when you're in a little tin ship out in the middle of the ocean and you're experiencing 40 foot swells and and just the power of the ocean. And to be in Florida, when I believe Florida is just at sea level. And so that in itself, where it doesn't take a lot of extra water to put Florida under it. Yeah, well, I tell you what, some of the keys, Marathon Key, Big Pine, the mid keys, they got hit really hard. Uh, the southern keys beyond that, they have some damage too. But there was a um, pretty bad situation going on, and it's ongoing. From what I understand, there's reports coming out that Marathon Key and around that area, they are recovering all kinds of bodies because hundreds or if not thousands of people stayed in that area when it was mandatory evacuation. But there's reports coming out that they're pulling out dozens and dozens of bodies, enough to fill 18 wheelers, reefer trucks. And uh, they haven't made it public yet because they have to notify next of kin and all this stuff. But I think there's going to be a rise in the death toll. Days go by and we see this, see this damage factor. Oh, one thing in the mix here, man, we didn't talk about in all this. That's a, uh, an effect of all this is the solar cycle we're in right now. And we had multiple X flares. I believe we've had three X class flares in the past seven days. And two of these hit right whenever Hurricane Harvey was out there. And these things mess with stuff. They will uh, have ground effects sometimes. They'll put out satellites, mess with communications, uh, mess with the electrical grid. But as you know, they say we are electrical beings and solar activity can mess with people's emotions, mess with people's minds. As a matter of fact, it can cause heart palpitations, headaches, and uh, actually mess up people with pacemakers. And we've been having a lot of those. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that was another thing that was discussed about this weekend. You know, if a lot of people don't, well, some people do, but if you realize of the sun being this huge furnace where explosions are happening on an enormous level, that the electromagnetic pole or the gravitational pole, if you want to use that as a label from the sun, when it dislodges these huge meteorites from the asteroid belt and they strike the sun, it just adds to these huge explosions. And when these massive electra ejecta, you know, depending on the position of the other planets, will also cause these expulsions from the sun to intensify. And if it intensifies towards the side of the sun that the earth is on then you can bet when this huge electromagnetic cloud hits the earth and and yes we do have our own kind of shielding but when it's a when it's a huger burst than usual there's there's more stability on some aspect and instability on others depending on the hemisphere of course and the positive negative of the earth field and like you said we're we're all electromagnetic fields ourselves and so as above so below the sun being the ultimate force in our solar system right now and our single cell being that micro force and they do a dance with each other and we feel the effects of it yeah and that amplifies and kind of kicking this all up we don't don't want to forget Major Red Dames, the, the famous remote viewer who saw what was called the kill shot. And a lot of people criticized him because they said it never came true. But what his kill shot was, was he said he saw something. What happened was there was a nuclear incident on the peninsula, on the Korean peninsula. And something came in between the earth and the sun and everybody looked up. And then the sun released this massive flare called the kill shot. And all of those things are in play right now. P perhaps what they saw in the viewing of a, an object that came, came, 
came between the Earth and the Sun was the eclipse we just experienced because everybody looked up at that and that was a big event. And so they could energetically pick that up in the viewing. And also in the timeline, a nuclear incident on the Korean Peninsula, he put this out years ago. So here we have Kim Jong-un with all these missiles and stuff. And we do have this massive amount of solar activity right now. So we could be getting up for the kill shot. Either way, we're running up the kill shot of the show. It's almost over. We got two minutes. And um, we will be back on Tuesday next week. I'm going to be talking about this Revelation 12 type event on the 23rd, what it is, what it isn't, and a few thoughts about that. Naysay, what would you like to say before we roll out of here tonight? Um, everybody get your uh, pemmican or your jerky ready. <laughs> just in case and if not it's one of those things that'll help you giggle during those low times exactly but it, just remember if you guys get a uh, bison ven- uh, bison um, jerky keep it away from Nase because he'll eat it all because oh, absolutely so much. <laughs> or you could send it to me if you got your if you got your bison jerky by all means you can send it to me <laughs> I, no yeah. don't please don't send me bison jerky oh man Anyway, thanks for joining me this evening. It's always fun. And we talk a little bit about everything here. A lot of stuff going on, people. Stay safe and have a good weekend because we have no idea what may be thrown at us. But one thing for sure, you've got to stay positive. You have to keep your mindset correct. Say no to fear. No matter what you see, you have to visualize. You have to know in your heart. You have to pray. You have to meditate. It's so important. It's so important because I tell you what, like Naysay was saying, the experience this past weekend, I'm seeing it. Things are speeding up. We're getting into an energetic now, especially from now to the end of this month. Things are going to start picking up pace. And when I say things, I mean everything. So you, you, you better have, hope you did, preload, preload your energetic with good things, good anticipation, good manifestation, good visions. And hope for the best in all of these things. And peace to you. All right, people, that is it. We're out of here. We only got a, uh, like 30 seconds here before we roll out. Um, so important. So important to stay focused and stay balanced. And keep love. Keep love in your heart. Love and hope. So important in these days. Anything else may I say? Uh, and uh, my always farewell, toodles. Toodles. Toodles indeed. And always my farewell. Find someone you love. Tell them that you love them. And say no to fear. That's it, people. See you next week. Have a good weekend. God bless. <laughs>